All right. Let me get started here. Okay, so obviously you guys are here to uh, learn a little bit about nutrition, some of this stuff. If you're clients of ours, you'll know a little bit about, but maybe not the whole picture, and that's what we're all about, to see the big picture here. Okay, for those of you who don't know me, don't know the background, uh, my name is Jason Rouleau. We've been here at the Crestfield Athletic Club for about uh, two and a half months, almost three months. Um, before that, we were at various other spots here in Chesterfield and done some uh, corporate training, uh, Monsanto Company and uh, Mallinckrodt. But um, I've been in the business about 15 years. So I have a degree in health management from Southeast Missouri State University and um, varied background in strength and conditioning at the collegiate and working with some professional teams, uh, but mostly in personal training. So um, about 1,200 clients I've trained in my time as a, as a trainer. Some of the people are here. I've been trained for 12 years or so. So uh, National Strength and Conditioning, uh, Certified Strength and Conditioning Specialist, ACSM, these are all acronyms you guys don't care about, but uh, certified by the International Society of Sports Nutrition. I am not a dietitian. I am not a licensed dietitian. However, I do know copious amounts about sports nutrition, which is kind of what we're involved in here. Um, I have a background in bodybuilding. Now I'm an obstacle course racer. Um, I've done the World Selfless Mother, which is a 24-hour competition. And you want to talk about nutrition, that will take it to the umpteenth end be able to go for 24 hours without, uh, without falling out. Um, and then this year I qualified for the world championships. So uh, that's a little bit about me. So <clears throat> now for the fun stuff, right? All right. Hopefully all the technology works right today. Okay. So the first question we ask clients when they come in and we talk about nutrition uh, with them is how would you say that you eat? Invariably they say, oh, pretty good, you know, I, I – I, I stray from time to time. Usually when we look at their, their recalls, we're like, good God, what the heck is this? Uh, because what you think is good and what we think is good may be judged on two different realms. If you're talking about a licensed dietitian, registered dietitian, they're looking at something completely different than what we're looking at. They're looking at math, you know, all your different vitamin content and all that kind of stuff. We don't look at that. I mean, I, I look at it in a general sense. But in an overall sense, I'm looking at food quality, your variety, how much protein you're getting, are you eating things in the right quantities, the right portion size, right uh, distribution, all that kind of stuff. So, <clears throat> feel pretty good at eating. Have a seat here. Um, so, this is the first question we ask clients. How would you say that you eat? Like I said, are you eating the right stuff? Is it high quality nutrition? How are your portions? Are your meals balanced? Okay. When I say balanced, Everybody thinks balanced meals like, oh, you get some vegetables, you get some Balanced meaning, uh, yes, you have some fruits, vegetables, all those things, but balance also means you have protein content in every single meal you eat. Because if you don't, when I say protein content, I mean like at least 10 grams. So if you don't, that's the first thing we're going to correct. So uh, do you avoid all carbohydrates or all fat because they're quote-unquote bad? Nothing's bad. Well, there are some things that are bad. Gooey butter cake, that's bad. But... There are a lot of stuff that, that you might think is bad that isn't necessarily bad. It's just how much are you eating of it. Uh, are you eating for your goals? And that's a real key. You've got to understand that you've got to eat for what you need. When I'm training for a bodybuilding competition, my diet is much different than if I was training for a 24-hour race. You know, you'd be surprised when people are training for a 24-hour race. People are training for endurance athletes. They eat junk. But guess what? They need to eat some junk because they need a lot of calories and they need to be absorbed quickly. So that's a little bit different. It's not uncommon to see Pop-Tarts and Oreos on a regular basis in a diet like that. Um, that isn't supposed to be the basis of their diet, but it is a lot of, uh, a lot of times what they're including. Um, the first thing you have to understand is what are your goals? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to lose weight? Are you Are trying to be more fit? Are you Are trying to run faster? Are you Are trying to run longer, do half Ironman, whatever it is? You've got to make sure you understand that when you're talking about how you're going to apply your eating plan, just like you, how, why are you applying a certain exercise plan. Do your workouts complement your eating? Okay? Uh, I'm going to be the first to tell you that if you read a muscle and fitness magazine, they talk about everything broken out because that's how bodybuilding for the last 30 years, like actually the last 40 years, likes to think. Everything is broken out. i got to train biceps and triceps today, legs, tomorrow, chest, and back another day. No. Your body is a series of systems. All of those systems work together. When you talk about exercise, it's a series of systems working together in coherence, and hopefully you're getting the right output 
So therefore, you're going to get the best or the maximum performance during your workout. But if your eating doesn't complement that, you're not going to have maximum performance. If, you know, I'm going to go race on a Saturday and I go out drinking the night before, Ken's I'm not going to have optimal performance. Even if I have a great performance, it's suboptimal, subpar, because you're, you're comparing it to a time when I should be in, uh, in optimum shape, having eaten the right stuff, having to make sure I was hydrated, all those things. So complementing your eating to your workouts is a big thing. We're going to talk about that today. What about water intake? Invariably, this is always a 100 fluid ounces for everyone in this room, bar none. That's the bottom line, baseline, except for maybe him. He's a little bit smaller. But uh, everybody in this room, 100 is baseline because we actually want fluid ounces per pound body weight. That's how much water. Now, usually, if you hit all of your numbers and you hit 100 of actual water, of actual liquid, you're probably up there because of the water's in your food and all that stuff. But you can't count that because we don't know exactly what that number is. So 100 is your baseline, 100 fluid ounces uh, a day minimum. That's three of these things, three of these. I drink about five of them. Right now, I'm actually decreasing my water intake because uh, I want to be able to race for eight miles and not have to drink. I will drink, but if I don't have to, it's better. So three of those is your minimum. If you're drinking light, three of these, you're a little behind the ball. So <clears throat> got to start with that. Okay, so what the heck's wrong? Calories are calorie, right? That's what, that's what I was told when I was in college, 19... 99, 98, 99 calories a calorie. I got in an argument with my professor because the professor of my friends didn't know shit. And sometimes they still don't know because the calorie is not a calorie. Your body does not process all calories the same, but you still have to watch what you're eating. Okay, carbs are not bad. That's some people think. Carbs are bad. Gluten's bad. Grains are bad. Bread's bad. Nothing's bad. But white bread's not good. We call it white death. But... If we can eat less of that and more of the, of the whole grain stuff, it's going to be a little bit better. Uh, I eat the same as so-and-so, but I see no change and they're losing weight like crazy. Okay, you can look the same. You can weigh the same. You are not the same as the person next to you. Okay, depends on how much muscle mass you have. depends on overall quote-unquote metabolism. depends on their activity level. You put Claire and Deb standing right next to you. Deb somehow manages to walk around her house and get 10,000 steps a day. If I didn't run, I wouldn't get 10,000 steps a day. I don't know where she's walking to. She must just be pacing back and forth. But 10,000 steps a day is good. It's a lot more activity than the average person gets. If you actually kept a, a Fitbit or something on you and see how many, how many paces you're actually getting in a day, it's not going to be nearly as much as most people think. The other thing you say is, I work out for two hours, but still get nothing. If I put a stopwatch on you for two hours and work in a gym, we'll see how much the actual number we get. If you're on a treadmill for two hours, you probably get two hours of work. But most people, most guys especially, they get in the gym and they're texting and then they're working. And then they're texting. Then they're watching TV. Then they're reading a magazine. Then they're working. Their two-hour workout turns out to be about 45 minutes of actual work time. So that actually matters. How hard are you pushing yourself? Because if you're in the gym for two hours, you probably are pushing yourself very hard. And that's also something we're going to talk about today. Because uh, unfortunately, if it uh, doesn't stress you, it doesn't elicit change. And that's what we got to do. Everything's got to stress the body. So, you know, confusion's a, a big part of this. And, and the media, in general, only furthers the confusion because they only throw bit pieces out at people, and that's what they see. They see the headlines, they see this, they see that, and they think they got the whole picture, and really all they do is just read one little thing. And they're like, oh, carbs are bad, grains are bad. No, not, not exactly. So uh, that, it only furthers the confusion like this. Vader is not supposed to be Hello Kitty. <laughs> so, all right. So the science. Pieces of the puzzle. That's the real key. Okay? Car and I'm going to get into my little uh, thing over there, so you probably can't see it right now, but it's going to get bigger in a minute. So, uh, not all car our cars are not all bad. It depends on what your goals are. So really what we're going to, you know, how many carbohydrates you need, what you're trying to accomplish. Are you trying to lose weight? Are you trying to gain muscle? Are you trying to perform, like I said before? Too much carbohydrates, and you're in trouble. Okay, that, that is a problem because your body only has a limited storage capacity for carbohydrates, and most people eat a lot of them, and they overflow that tank, and then they end up turning fat. So that's a, that's a problem. In fact, unfortunately, your body does not have, a, limit, does not have a, a storage tank for fat. It just 
adds on another it's like extensions to your house. If you just limited, if you run out of room, you just add another extension to your house. That's kind of how it works. You just add another extension. Um, but there are some different things to, to consider when you talk about carbohydrates. You talk about highly refined carbs, carbohydrates like white bread, like sugar, anything that's processed down into, into you know, for Pop-Tarts, for example, highly refined, easily absorbed. It goes in your system like that. And it goes in your system like that, it has a little bit more tendency to be stored as fat. Because, again, when you, as soon as you hit that top-off level, you know, things are, things are going to go bad. So you want something that's slower digesting. You want something that's going to have less likely of it, have a chance to drop right into that storage tank. And at least if it's out in your system and it's a little more slower absorbed, then you're not going to have that same insulin effect. I'm going to get into a little bit of this in, in a second here. Um, high fructose corn syrup. You go ahead and come in. Good. Uh, have a seat wherever. Um, science, I've worked those corn syrup. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit this, and I'm going to try to limit the amount of science on this just so we don't confuse too many people. But here's the deal. I've worked those corn syrup is not uh, absorbed the same way everything else is. So when you add your soda, it's not the same thing as having uh, the soda back in the day, Pepsi. Um, Pepsi 19, circa 1984 versus now is a big difference, okay? Having your Gatorade versus having... Um, uh, soda or having anything that's got added sugar, it's a lot different. <clears throat> you guys still passing around my little uh, sign-in sheet? Let's make sure it's getting around here. Um, okay, so high fructose corn syrup, this is quick, quick, uh, quick rundown. Okay, you eat something, goes in your system, goes in your bloodstream. Uh, sugars get shuttled by a hormone called insulin, gets shuttled in and out with insulin glucagon, goes in and out of your uh, bloodstream into wherever it needs to, okay? It's quick science. I'm not going to get into that. It's too, far too deep for anything in this discussion. But I've heard those corn syrup doesn't work like that. goes into the hepatic portal vein. Guess what? That goes directly to the liver. liver says, hey, I'm full. Off the storage. So it is not going through the rest of the pathways and going throughout the whole body and figuring out which muscles need to be deposited into and all this kind of stuff. So if you've got a full liver full of glycogen, it's all busting at the seams, you're in trouble. So uh, fructose is not a good choice when you're talking about recovery. It's also not a good choice when you're talking about somebody who doesn't exercise a whole lot. Uh, so you know, you talk about uh, the antichrist and high fructose corn syrup, that's what they're talking about it's because it's not absorbed the same way. It does not fill you up. Here's the biggest problem with it, other than all that I just told you. You can drink it and drink it and drink it and drink it and drink it. And your body says, I still need some food. If you drink milk, if you drink any other, basically anything else other than something that's um, high in fructose, something that goes to the normal system, the insulin, the insulin basically tells the body, stop, we don't need any more. Well, when it doesn't go through that system, you can keep drinking it, which is why if you drink 44 ounces of a big gulp in a day, every single day, you are guaranteed to gain weight because there's nothing you can do about it. Your body is not set up that way. We've been, we've been basically evolving over the course of the last, 50,000 years to be a certain way, and when science twists and turns some of the chemicals, uh, it's still a carbohydrate, but it's not exactly like your body thought it was going to be, so it's a little bit higher level of um, ingestion than we're used to, and your body hasn't had a chance to adapt to it yet. And without that adaptation, without that time, it makes people overweight. The same thing with refined, overly refined carbohydrates. The body's not used to having to deal with so many of those, and it causes, causes the problem. You've got to understand evolution is kind of slow. The human body is an unbelievably complex machine, but if you don't give it time to adapt, bad things happen. Okay? Fat. Not all fat is bad. Okay? You've got to have fat in your system. If you don't eat any fat, you cut all the fat out of your diet, your hormones don't transport properly because you need fat to transport your hormones. It's what protects your hormones. If you don't have it, your hormone levels will go down. If hormone levels go down, chances are you're probably going to have some problems. If your testosterone or estrogen levels go down, most people gain weight. So when those things start, especially if your testosterone goes down, so when those things start to happen, you know, you've got some trouble. So you've got to have some fat. Fat is also a good, pretty good uh, filler, meaning it keeps you full. So there are good things. You know, you're eating nuts and different things. That's good fat. Now you go out and having chicken wings and french fries and corn nuggets and 
uh, whatever else you're eating that's fried, now that's not exactly the same thing. So that's not what we're looking for. Um, but good fats are, are, need to be in there. You know, the non-hydrogenated trans fats, and, you know, the, the European diet, quote unquote, that includes a lot of oils, the olive oil, that type of nature, uh, those things are all good. So that you, you need those things. But it's getting a little bit extra, too many extras. And the fact that it's calorically dense, meaning uh, it doesn't take nearly as much of it to get, enough, get a whole lot of calories in it as it does other, other substrates. This is all stuff you guys probably know. So, protein. If I ask a show of hands in here, what does protein do? It helps the body repair. Right? It does do that. It does a lot of other things. But if I sat here and force-fed you protein shakes all day long and we didn't go downstairs, you wouldn't get any muscles. But you would not get fat. And I'm going to tell you why. So, that's, dietitians will tell you, oh, you get fat. You eat too much protein, you get fat. Why are Atkins people losing weight? Because the body does not efficiently use, car use proteins for energy. It doesn't really want to. Okay? And that's one of the things. Okay, so you see on here, well, you might not be able to see it. I need to back that thing up a little bit. It says low caloric. I know you can't see it because you're sitting in the back. Okay. <laughs> low, low caloric density. Okay, what that means is just four calories per gram of fat. Everybody heard that? I mean, four gram of protein. Everybody heard that for? Four grams. Not really. Okay, because it takes energy to break that apart and use it. So when you break it apart and the body knows that, it takes heat, causes heat, causes all kinds of problems. So the body's like, ah, let's see, do I need this? Do I really need this? I don't know. If I don't need it, I'm just going to get rid of it because I really don't want to go through this process. If I go through the process to break this down and use this for energy, it's going to be bad because it's going to cost a lot of energy for me to do that. Now, it can do it, and it will do it. It's just a slow process, and most people do not eat so much protein that it becomes an issue. Uh, so that slow process, a ketogenic diet, usually results in weight loss if they're not taking a whole lot of carbohydrates. I'll get into the reason why in a minute. Uh, now, nothing is built in a vacuum, and then it's not 100% guaranteed, although I do know bodybuilders that aren't on steroids that take in three or 400 grams of protein and don't have any problems. Now, it's not real good on your kidneys, but it's not going to kill you. It's probably not going to have any long-term effects. But it also does a few other things, which is what we use it for. Okay? So protein also keeps you full. It's slow. It's like a big brick in your stomach. It takes up some time to break down, and that keeps you full. If we can keep you full, we can stop you from eating all the junk that you have in your pantry. That's the key. Because if we can make you full and keep you full for a little while, it's going to make that process better. When he talked about getting into the bloodstream, protein also slows down the absorption of stuff, slows down the amount of insulin that's thrown out into the system. If you don't have insulin because you're diabetic, you probably pump it in somewhat. Um, the body doesn't need quite as much of it because it's got this protein kind of insulated. Fat does the same thing, but again, fat is calorically dense. Um, so fat is a net 9, and protein is a net 2.6. That's a technical number. Uh, might be 2.4. I think it's 2.6, though. Regardless, it's a lot, a lot lower. So this is the net. So you have to eat a lot of this in order to get the same amount of calories than anything else, net. So that's the thing. When we tell clients, we tell them, okay, here's the deal. We want you to take in protein with your diet, with every single meal, because it's going to slow down the absorption. The other thing is because the body does not have really a storage tank for amino acids other than your muscle. It doesn't really have a place to throw that protein. I'm going to wait for it later. We'll put that over here, and we'll wait for later. Nope. Body's like, do I need it? Do I need it? Nope. Okay. Set it on. So it, it, doesn't really, it doesn't wait very long. So since you constantly need protein in your system, we might as well go ahead and get it in every single meal. You can spread it out throughout the whole day. It keeps your blood sugar nice and, nice and even rather than this roller coaster ride. Anybody ever get up in the morning? I'm going to go have a bread coat bagel. And then that's about 8 a.m., and then about uh, 9.30, 10 o'clock, or it could be Cheerios, uh, 9.30, 10 o'clock, ah, I need something to eat. I'm hungry. Or my blood sugar is getting a little low. I've got to eat something. You know what happened? That happened because you made a poor choice earlier in the day. It's reality. Your roller coaster ride is about ready to begin, so hold on tight. What are you looking for? Hey, Jane, down at the end of the... Desk row here has got some Snicker bars over there. I'm going to go have one of them. Take in one of them. Packed with peanuts. Really, Snickers really satisfies. It also makes your blood sugar raise back up. Okay, I feel good. I'm going to wait till lunch. Lunch. Oh, 
Ooh, I'm hungry again. I'm going to go over here and ah, this bread looks good. I'm going to get some of that. And I'm going to have this sandwich with my big old ciabatta roll. I'm going to have my Diet Coke. And I'm going to be all good. And then about 3 o'clock, ooh, I'm getting hungry again. Where's that Snicker bar? That's an ongoing problem. Because you keep going and because you didn't plan and because you keep choosing the wrong foods, you keep getting hungry. If you got up in the morning instead of having your Cheerios, you had Kashi Goldine, now you got this big fibrous protein laden brick in your stomach. And that's good stuff because you're probably not going to need anything. And guess what? Even better about it, it is only like 260 calories for an entire bowl with, with milk. So now you made a great choice, and now you're not quite as hungry. You probably need to eat something mid morning, but we're going to eat something like a cheese stick and an apple. Uh, every single day of the week, right, Claire? Uh, and uh, you have that, and then, okay, now I'm held over toward lunch, and now lunch, instead of eating this big old hawking sandwich, I can eat like half of it, and hopefully I would get a little bit of extra protein on it, get double the meat, and then we'll be good to go there, buy an apple with that, and then mid-afternoon I'm going to have, uh, you know, whatever you want, um, you know, Greek yogurt, you know, something else, and then that'll tie me over to dinner, and I can eat small all throughout the day instead of going on this roller coaster ride. That's the key. That's what we're looking for. But if you try other diets, certain things are changed, like the paleo diet. So when you look at this, which this, everybody seen the food guide pyramid? I'm going to read this off. Everybody seen the food, food guide pyramid? Well, this is the paleo guide pyramid. And the, the meats and the healthy fats are down here at the bottom of that. This is all okay. I don't know why. That looks like butter. I don't know why that's in there. Um, but, you know, we got some meats. I don't, I don't so much mind this. And I really don't mind this all that much except this. This is where the grains and all the, uh, uh, some of the good, you know, there's dairy. It is an actually pictured here, but there's dairy over here because they don't have dairy in a paleo diet. That stuff needs to be in here. They need it in here somewhere because dairy's good, as long as you're not lactose intolerant. Dairy's good. Um, carbs are okay. They're not bad. You need to have some. So we need to have it in here somewhere. It needs to be in here. Fruits are good at the top. We don't want the old-fashioned food guide pyramid, which is why they switched it now, it goes vertical. Uh, we don't want all these carb-rich, laden foods all down there at the bottom. That's the way Americans choose their diet usually, and that's how they got bigger. So we don't really want that. So we're going to change it a little bit, but we're not going to cut anything specifically out unless you got celiac disease or something like that. Gluten's okay. We want the good stuff, but it's not too bad. Okay, so paleo's a... It's the, it's the fad diet of right now. There's nothing really, quote-unquote, wrong about it, other than the fact that they want you to just uh, out and out cut some stuff out. I can tell you right now, in Paleolithic age, I don't really think they eat like that. They're probably just looking for anything they can eat. But um, it's, uh, they also, they, they weren't such good hunters back then because they weren't that smart. Um, so, anyway, long story short is, what we're going to get back to is, blood sugar, and glycogen, which is stored sugars in the muscles, okay? That's really what this is all about. That's what this talk is all about, because I'm going to explain this in a way that's a little bit different than you've probably heard before. And I'm going to be honest with you, it cannot be proven. And there's a reason it cannot be proven, because everybody has different glycogen levels, and unless they biopsy every single muscle in your body, which would hurt like heck, by the way, you know, biopsy, if you biopsy needle, stick one of those in every single muscle, they would, it is, it's very difficult to tell exactly how, many gly, how much glycogen in your sister, system at any one time. I will tell you, as we go through this conversation, I'm going to explain why certain diets work certain ways and why certain groups of people follow certain diets and how they kind of all get the same effect. You just didn't realize it. Okay, so there is maybe, I know there's one person in this room that can explain this, but most people are like, what? This is the chemical compound glycogen. It is the muscular sugar, the storage, basically the main storage ability for the body for sugar throughout the whole system. There's glycogen in the liver, there's glycogen in the muscle. That's this. It is stored sugar, dextrose. Can we see dextrose? That's what it is. Dextrose is sugar. Okay? So, say, that's what it is. Why do you care? Anybody know why I care? Why, why do I care so much about your glycogen level? Anybody know? Energy do what? Well, anybody ever wake up in the morning and get a little lightheaded? Low blood sugar, quote unquote, don't feel so well. Not like lightheaded because uh, you took too much uh, caffeine or, you know, some of these other things, but lightheaded because your blood, you get a little shaky. Okay, that's your liver glycogen. 
It's a little low. It's tapped out. It needs to be bumped up a little bit so it can speed up and get the systems all going again. Your March glycogen is more going to be felt when you're doing, uh, if anybody ever runs, and you go out and you do a good long run on Saturday, and on Sunday you're going to go run some hills, and you try to run the hills, and it feels like somebody just put 15 pound weights on each foot and you can't get them moving. It's because your glycogen in your legs is lower. Okay, you tapped it out and you didn't replenish it. It takes a uh, minimum 18 uh, to 24 hours to replenish glycogen, and if it's a good amount, it could take up to three days. And that's under a normal diet, normal, normal conditions. However, if you eat like this little kid ate, anybody see this? What happens? I blacked out. All I remember was saying, I'll try a piece. If you can see it, he ate half the cake. That would definitely cause uh, some insulin shock here. Okay, but why is this all important? Why does this matter? Okay, because it's the key. Every diet you hear about, uh, not every, most diets you hear about have a way of controlling things. Controlling your portion sizes, controlling how much you eat, how much how many carbohydrates you eat, how many grains you eat, how many sugars you eat, whether it be Sugar Buster, Zone Diet, uh, South Beach Diet, Atkins Diet, Paleo, they all control something. And basically that control makes you decrease the amount of calories you take in. Now, probably because of the way the Western diet works, you're going to decrease the amount of carbohydrates you take in. When you decrease the amount of carbohydrates you take in, this goes down. Okay, so Atkins diet, for instance. I'm going to get through this very quickly. Atkins diet, your carbohydrates are basically probably 20% uh, or less of your total calorie intake. So your glycogen stores will very quickly go from where they are to 50% of where they're supposed to be. Okay. Anybody in here ever done an Atkins type diet? Nobody. That's a, and this is a freaking anomaly right now. Uh, huh? Well, it's not being a little more moderated. It's not. It's going to have a similar effect. Okay, so the Atkins diet, you have uh, what's called the Atkins fog. You get stupid, and that just happens. That's the way it works. Okay, your blood sugar drops, and your glycogen storage drops, and guess what? Your brain uses 47%, approximately 47% of the carbohydrates you take in for its own usage because your brain can only run on sugar. And when it doesn't have anything, you're like really slow. I've done it because I train for bodybuilding contests. Most bodybuilders use that type of a diet in order to cut weight quickly. Okay, so you're over, everything's moving really slow. Your ability to retain what somebody's telling you decreases. And more than anything, you will know if somebody's on a low-carbohydrate diet because they are moody. Really, really moody. In fact, I have a buddy that got, he broke up with his girlfriend because he did not heed my warning when it was coming. He said, she's training for a contest, man. This is going to really suck for the next two, three weeks. You've got to weather that storm because it'll get better because her body gets used to it. She'll start, you know, functioning a little bit better. He's like, I can't take it. She's being a total B. I can't handle it. You know, I'm done. Then he goes through that diet six or eight months later, and he's like, oh, I can't believe I did that. It was so stupid because now I know what it's feeling like. Okay? It's a good thing to understand it. It's not necessarily a good thing to go through it, but it works. It drops your glycogen levels down. It does it all through diet. If you're a bodybuilder, you're doing it through exercise and diet and all these things, but your glycogen levels drop way down. Okay? Exercise. You can drop it down through that. Strength training drops it. Depending on your diet, you may be able to get it back in there pretty quickly, depending on how your exercise actually works. Intervals. Interval training. That's the new fad. Guess what? I've been doing interval training 15 years. I'm ahead of the curve. So, interval training drops your glycogen levels down pretty quickly. It's hardcore. The harder core it is, the faster that glycogen's coming down. And if that glycogen level comes down, you're probably in pretty good space. We use a combination of strength training and interval training. Not the same as CrossFit, but in one way or another it is, because that glycogen level comes down. As I've been talking about the whole time, glycogen levels come down, you lose, you know, you lose strength, you lose the ability of, uh, of your brain to work correctly. But for all intents and purposes, I'm going to explain this as easy, as simple way as I can. Okay. You had a moderated diet. You exercised a little bit today, and this is where you are. This is your body's tank. Okay, this is glycogen right here. And then you decide, I'm going to go have some pizza. I'm going to have a few glasses of wine. Oh, they got dessert. I'm going to have a little bit of dessert. Uh-oh. What's that? That's fat. So, <laughs> ah, that was a good workout. I'm going to do one. Ah, okay. Now we're back to where we need to be. 
right? Now you're back to ground zero. The thing is, you don't ever want to get past this point because if you have a bad day, we can get up here a little bit, and you be, excuse me, you can get uh, you can get a little bit, and you're okay. But if you ever start the day and you don't get your workout in, you start eating too many carbohydrates, you fill the tank back up. Guess what? You're going to be all over the floor, and you're not going to fit into the clothes you're wearing, and you're not going to be happy with yourself, and you think it just And you knew it was getting full because you just kept eating those things over and over again. Carbs are bad, but they end up on the floor because you ate too many of them. That was your own fault. Okay? So the reality is you have to exercise bring that stuff down. Okay? Our idea with exercise is to keep you moderated. You don't have to get real complicated in order to stay moderated, but if you stay in that little stint right there, all of the diets that you're talking about put you in that spot. The question is, can you stay there? How long can you stay focused? It's all about keeping that glycogen stored down because it's the only thing that ties them all together. Bodybuilders do low-carb diet, but they train like crazy. They eat protein like crazy. Atkins diet people eat fat like crazy. Paleo people don't eat any grain. They all do a combination of exercise. Hopefully, that will get them there. It's not going to be enough. You can't over. We always say you can't overrun a bad diet, but it it can bring that level down. The people that train more hardcore, they get in there and they fuss it. You think they're getting results because they're tougher than you? Actually, they are, because they're pushing themselves to the point where they can make changes, and that's what we're all about. It's pushing yourself to that point because that push, that little extra push, that extra little bit, you know, getting on the treadmill and doing what you're comfortable with will. Drain that glycogen down, but it's real slow. But if I get you in there and we do 30 minutes of hardcore interval training, that stinks while you're doing it, but it will bring it down. So that's what we're looking for. Everything's about bringing it down. How are we going to keep it down? How are we not going to replenish it? How are we going to keep it where we want it to be the whole time? Maximizing your training will improve your nutritional effects. Improving your nutrition, your nutrition is going to maximize your training, right? It's a reciprocal thing. It works together. When we're talking about strength training, we're talking about training in general, that's where I got in with that bodybuilding thing, that old antiquated thing that everything works by itself. I'm going to do bicep curls today. I'm going to do squats tomorrow. I'm going to do shoulders on Friday, Saturday. I'm like, no. Are you trying to get bigger and stronger? Yes. Okay. Let's go train upper body today. Let's go train the whole body. Let's push ourselves. Let's work hard. Let's do some muscle damage because assuming you're not taking in steroids or any kind of performance-enhancing drugs, you're not limited by how much damage you can do. You're limited by what you can recover in. So in, in the amount of time that you can recover, which you're given in a given time frame, 72 hours, if you haven't recovered in that time frame, guess what? You are going to. You do enough of those and you're overtraining. You end up getting injured. You end up tiring out, all those things. So strength training and interval training, which is what we base our workouts on, we do them together in the same workout. You might do two sets of strength and do an interval. CrossFit does the same thing. CrossFit, you've got to get kind of crazy. They throw weights all over the place. But they do all of their strength and then all of their conditioning. But it happens in a similar fashion. They push themselves to get pretty good results. And lo and behold, they start including interval training. Somebody stops doing their, 30, their 45 minutes on treadmill, just walking at a certain pace, start adding in intervals of going up and down. They throw in a, a bike. They throw in some rower. And all lo and behold, they start losing weight. It must be the fact that I changed it up. Well, that's part of it, but it also the fact that you burn a little more sugar. When we do something like this, our training style is called the high-max system, high-intensity, maximum anaerobic cross-training. Train muscles. At the same time, we improve the metabolic recovery. When I say metabolic recovery, the fact you get down here after a set, okay, that's your metabolic system saying, Okay, we gotta get rid of some carbohydrate or some uh, carbon dioxide. Increase, increase breathing, increase that breathing rate. Get that stuff out of the system. The better you are at doing that, the more efficient you are. The faster I can get you back into the next exercise. Okay, so we want to improve that metabolic recovery. We're gonna burn maximum glycogen because we're using all kinds of stuff. If I asked you, okay, you're gonna do biceps, triceps today, but she's gonna do whole body. Who do you think burns more glycogen? The whole body, because you got big muscles right here. And all this stuff being stressed versus these little muscles right here. Even if you talk about a big bodybuilder, these are still nothing. So 
If you're talking about a whole body effect, that's the reason why you want to do that. If you're trying to lose body fat, you want to do that. If you're trying to gain muscle, you know, a whole body, it depends on your, and on all the stuff, but in the general sense, your body's recovery is going to be much better if you're using an upper, lower, or whole body type routine. Um, so that's probably better for you as well. Greatest hormonal effect happens between 24 and 27 sets of exercise in one workout. That takes about an hour, 24 to 27 sets. If you're doing it an hour, if you do a half hour workout, you better include some cardio after that because you're working the whole body. There's a great stress, and that great stress causes the body to react, causes more hormonal changes than if you're just using biceps, triceps type of thing. So that's what we're looking We have to look at the big picture. The big picture training, big picture diet. Like you said, if you cut out too much fat, you don't have the same results. Most efficient time. If you're in there busting, okay, I'm not watching Oprah today. I'm going to work out. The TV's on. I don't care. My radio's on. I'm not texting between sets. I'm rolling. I'm getting my stuff done, and I'm going to get out of here. Okay, those are the most efficient workouts. Those are the ones you get the best results out of. And the reason you get the best results out of them is because you're motivated. You have a plan, and you're ready to rock it. Okay, well, I just epoch. This is uh, overblown a little bit, but it, it is, does have an effect. Epoch, excess post-oxygen consumption, afterburn. How many calories are you burning because of the stress you cause on the body? Guess what that stress, part of that stress is? Anybody want to guess? You. What is that? What's that epoch? You. You know. What's going on? No. What I'm asking is, what is part of the post-oxygen consumption? What is the body trying to get back to? What state is it trying to get back to after you just busted it with a workout? Yeah, it's trying to get back. What, what, what's homeostasis? Get it. Okay, so it's baseline. What was baseline? It's trying to get this back to the point at which it can maintain. If you don't let it, it's always chasing a ghost. And that's where you want it. Because chasing the ghost is the time that you lose body fat. The longer it chases the ghost, the better results you have. So if you look at it that simply, there's a lot of other things that go into excess post-oxygen consumption. It's rebuilding muscle fibers. It's doing this. It's doing that. It's trying to get your hormone levels back in check. It's trying to just understand that during that whole process, it's trying to get the glycogen levels back to normal. And if you're not giving it enough to get back there, the stress is of the body. It's like, whew. And then getting back. So let's go ahead and do something else. And then it tries to find energy elsewhere so that you can be overall functional. And that's what the thing is. So understand, by limiting your overall carbohydrate consumption below whatever your maintenance level is, you're going to be in a fat-burning mode. You want to call it that. And that's where I want to be all the time if you're trying to lose fat. If you're, a, if you're an exercising athlete and you want to be as fast as possible, you've got to make sure you know where that homeostasis is. Because you've got to get back there as quick as you can. Because tomorrow's workout's going to stink if you don't. So we want to run fast. You've got to get your glycogen levels back up. So it's the exact reverse of whatever thing we actually do. We try to make sure we get the right kind of carbohydrates in. We try to get them in there fast. We try to get them in the right quantities. All those things are important. Yes, ma'am. You can exercise. You just don't want to cause a whole lot of muscle damage. Um, because soreness is, a, is the body's way of repairing. The swelling, soreness is caused by swelling. It's like a bunch of hot dogs stacked on top of each other, and they all start swelling. And in between the hot dogs, there's a bunch of nerves. And they just squeeze down on the nerves, and the nerves don't like it. So that's just swelling. But if you keep moving, it helps the recovery. But if you overstress them, it causes problems. So lactic acid is gone by the time you leave this gym. It's out. Because lactic acid is a, it's a reversible process. I'm not going to get into the Krebs cycle, but it... it, it as long as, the, as long as there's carbohydrates and you're still breathing, oxygen's still getting in, if it, that Krebs cycle keeps thinning, eventually when you stop exercise, when, when you're exercising, your arms are burning, it stops moving. And it stops, it doesn't move fast enough, and you're not getting rid of all the stuff you need, which is why your muscle burns and all, I, everything stops. It doesn't stop completely, but it basically, for all sorts of purposes, stops. And you stop working out, and then it starts spinning again, and all lactic acid gets out of it. That's not what causes it. The soreness is not caused by that. If you didn't have lactic acid in your, in, your, in your bloodstream and it was left, then you'd have a real problem. So it's, it's, not a, it's a byproduct of energy, but it's not left. What causes the soreness is, is damage to the muscle and swelling. So um, you can do all you want. And, and when somebody says, I've got to work the lactic acid, I gotta, yes, you've got to work out the swelling, but the swelling is not lactic acid. That's not what's causing it. 
So, here with the program. This is all what I've been talking about. Nutrition and exercise work together. Everything works together. Nutrition, when we say eat every three hours, that's five to six meals per day, meals and snacks per day, protein-based meals, limit liquid calories because they're not really going to fill you up now. The two things that are kind of off that chart are milk and protein shakes. Uh, but for the most part, limit the liquid calories. Watch your carb portions because we want to keep that tank down. Limit evening calories. Why evening calories? Well, if your tank is full and you take in too much and then you go to bed, you're not moving around, you have less likely, you're, you're not going to use up that, that stuff, so it's probably going to get stored. It all comes down to whether or not you used up enough to keep your tank out of the, out of the, out of the full level. Most people are at home at night, and that's why they tend to eat more calories at night. When that happens, they tend to gain their, that's when they're, if they're taking in the bulk of their calories at night, then the body's trying to digest all that stuff through sleep. Through the time that they're sleeping, everything slows down, you're more likely to gain, more likely to absorb it. So that's why I limit evening calories. It's not that evening necessarily is bad, but if you're going over the top, it's probably going to be in the evening time. Nutrient timing is key. That's the thing. And that's, what, that's one, of the, one of the biggest things I'm going to get into in the next slide. Making sure you eat to optimally repair, optimally keep moving. Exercise is all the things I just explained, okay? So we got four times a week, including strength and cardio. That's a minimum. Um, strength exercises, 12 to 20 exercises minimum. Okay, that's 45 minutes. Remember I told you, optimally, if you're looking for a hormonal change, it's 24 to 27. But some people don't have that endurance and don't have that kind of time, so getting in there and getting to 12 to 20 is going to be pretty good. All muscle groups, again, we talked about that, including interval and stretch afterwards. Don't stretch before. It's kind of stretching. It's for increasing flexibility. And if you're trying to stretch before and your muscles aren't warmed up, you're not going to get very good flexibility out of that anyway. So we stretch after the workout. So that's... Uh, all of this works together. That's the key. You've got to think about everything together. Okay. Yes, sir. You're I'm going to tell you, whenever your quote-unquote circadian rhythm says you're going to work out the hardest, that's when you should work out. It doesn't matter that much. Some people work out better in the morning. Some people time, time frame-wise. Whenever you're going to get it done, because if the idea is at the end of the day, if you, take, if you need to take in 2,000 calories to maintain, and you work out in the morning, and you take in 2,000 calories, you'll maintain. If you take in uh, 2,400 calories and bulk of that in the evening time, you're walking a fine line. So it really doesn't matter as long as you take in right what you're supposed to and you get your workout in there. Because, again, you're, all, you're not only burning the, action, burning the stuff while you're working out, your body's trying to get back to homeostasis, is what he said. Okay? And it, it's not, not going to be there for two or three days. So you don't need to worry about it as long as your calorie numbers are right. So it, the key is just keeping everything in balance. But we don't get into that. The first problem we have is getting people to work out. Once we get them in there, then we start worrying about all that stuff. So nutrient timing. Do not underestimate the importance of this. Okay? We talk about nutrient timing. We're talking about vitamins, superfoods in the morning, you know, getting, making sure you're getting all the stuff. Super, like Zeal. That's one of my race sponsors. I take that stuff every single day. I get pretty good results out of it, and I get everything I need in one little thing. Sometimes I mix protein powder with it, but it makes sure that I've got what I need if I miss anything. That's the key. You've got to make sure if you miss stuff that you're getting it. So that's what the vitamins are. If I told you we're going to jump off, jump out of an airplane, and chances are you probably will never use your backup shoot. So guess what? We're not going to include it. You're going to jump. I didn't have time to pack your shoot. All the way. So we just got the regular shoot. Anybody want, anybody want to jump without that backup shoot? No, right? Hopefully no. Uh, I've jumped before and I didn't think anything of it until the person ahead of me up in the thing had to pull their shoot. I'm like, hope my shoot's packed right. So the key is, is that if you don't have everything in the right amount, you might be in need of the extra vitamins. So you might as well take them in. Nothing better than just having that extra little thing just to make sure. Again, the five to six meals a day is to keep you balanced throughout the day to make sure everything stays in the right portion size. That's how you do it. 45 minutes pre-workout, you've got to have something because if you have, not, if you have not ate anything, let's say you're working out at 5 p.m., you haven't ate anything since 12 noon, 
you're not running on full, and I'm going to come in here and kick your butt because you're not pushing. You're not able to push yourself. You're not. You're not fueled. So you got to eat something a little bit before your workout to keep you ready to roll. Because again, it's about effort during the workout. After the workout, the body is starving. Maybe not literally starving, but physically it's starving. It needs that recovery, and it needs to get something within an hour. Okay? It needs to have protein. Protein shake is perfect for that. If you're here at the gym and you've got to go home and cook, uh, cook foods, you need, unless you're going to stop at fifth flavor, which she's already cooking for you, uh, the key is you've got to have those foods uh, ready to roll as soon as you get home. Otherwise, you might as well have a protein shake. They go home and cook dinner, and you can have a smaller dinner portion that you would have before. If you're working out in the morning, make sure you've got your protein shake because you can't wait to get to work and wait to cook that food because unless you're working right down the street, it's going to take too long. You've got to hit that 60 minutes. If you don't get it within 60 minutes, here's the effect. It's the same effect as if you went all day, metabolically, you went all day and didn't eat for eight hours. Your body has that same starvation effect, and it basically is like, eh. okay, well, I missed that window, next window. So it's important. You want to get that in there. Um, and then, again, a couple hours after, work, after, uh, after you eat at that point, you want to eat again because the body's still starving for that recovery. If you don't, Infuse glycogen. If you don't eat a lot of carbohydrates afterwards, you're going to be in a depleted state. And if you're trying to lose fat, that's what you want. If you're trying to recover, you're trying to gain muscle, you're trying to perform, you want that glycogen. So you want to have some carbohydrates afterwards. So I'm trying to hit kind of all the different things because a lot of people like to lose weight, but some people want some different goals, and that's what you got. To, that's what the difference is. Like I said, for those looking to gain, uh, gain muscle, or uh, if you're just hungry at night, a casein protein shake. Casein is the thicker, the thicker part of milk. Um, that, as soon as that hits your stomach, it's acid sensitive. It turns into a brick, a literal like, t basically it looks like uh, Greek yogurt in your stomach. So if you want something that's going to fill you up at night, you have one of those. You can have a mixed protein shake, a protein shake like Claire takes in. That one has a mixture in it. That will get you uh, pretty good results as well. Okay, I'm going to start cutting through this pretty quick here. So, All right, supplements. Supplements are sometimes necessary. Athletes supplement. Um, people that hardcore train supplement because they want that little bit of an edge. So sometimes they're necessary. Vitamins, superfoods like zeal, protein powders, uh, whether it be whey, casein, protein bars, energy bars, anything that, anything that you need to help you out is better than nothing. Okay, we want real foods. We hope that you could get everything you wanted, everything you needed from real foods, but that's not the case. Our busy lifestyles prevent that. We don't eat as often as we're supposed to. We only eat the quantities that we're supposed to. We a lot of times eat too much at lunch, then we're not hungry for a mid mid afternoon snack, you know, all these things. So having some options are, are different. If you're trying to gain muscle, creatine is a good option. If you're trying to lose body fat, thermogenics don't necessarily help all that much except for a placebo effect because the the FDA is kind of limited what we can get over the counter. Uh, but if you want that, if this is what you need to motivate you, if this is what you need to get you into the gym, you can take it. It's not going to get you that much better results if you're taking, you know, hydroxycut or, you know, uh, Commander Go Pack or whatever the heck uh, something the Superstore sells. You might get a little bit of effect, but you can get a lot more effect out of self-control. So that's the real key. Okay. My final thoughts on this part of the presentation, we're going to go on. I'm going to let Jillian talk a little bit here. Uh, final thoughts, proper nutrition isn't only about quantity, it's also about quality. You cannot go home and eat Zana sausages and hot dogs and tell me I have my protein because I will slap you silly. That is not the kind of protein. You might as well go eat the dog food out of the bowl because that's basically the same level of nutrition that you're getting. You cannot be a Ferrari eating that stuff. And if you want your body to be properly fueled and properly and have proper nutrition over the course of the rest of your life, you need to make these changes um, because that's what it's all about. Intense exercise plus proper diet plus nutrient timing plus quality supplementation plus recovery equals maximal results. This is the paragon that professional athletes and high-level athletes are. You may not be that high-performing, but that doesn't mean you can't get similar effects. So focus on what you're doing. Train hard, eat right, supplement selectively. Now I'm going to do, this is the last thing I want to say before I dump this over and you guys can ask questions at the end. Here's the thing. I'm going to do this very simply. And I know I, I have these numbers, and it, the biggest problem that people have is they cannot focus. You have to stay focused. What do you want? Okay. 
If you tell me, I want to lose 12 pounds, okay, I'm going to give you four months. It's very simple. Okay, everybody ready for this? Okay. There are how many months, how many weeks in a month? Four, right? Okay, four weeks in a month. Okay, so if you're going for four months, we're going to try to lose, um, actually, let's go, let's go 12 weeks. So we'll just use that. Okay, so we're 12 weeks. In 12 weeks, how much weight can I lose? Okay, so let's figure this out. 12 weeks, there are seven days in a week. There are um, 3,500 calories in a, in a pound. So all in all, I need to make sure that I'm going to be able to lose 12 pounds. Do the math, however many calories that is exactly. The main key is, in that amount of time frame, one pound a week gets you the, what? Gets you the weight loss, right? One pound a week, that's 3,500 calories. Okay, this is the simplicity of how this works. If you simply eat 250 less calories a day and burn 250 more calories a day, that's 25 to 30 minutes in the gym and one less mocha chocolate from Starbucks for every day for, four, for 12 weeks, you will lose 12 pounds. It is that freaking simple. Just do it. Stop going to Starbucks. Get your butt out of the bed. Go to the gym. Do it for 12 weeks, and you will get the results you want. You have to stay focused. It is that simple. When the athlete that we train wants to train for the Olympics, it is two years away. He knows he's got the Olympics coming up. He might go out and drink today. He might train hard. He doesn't. But the closer he gets, the more he knows. I got to stay focused here. Michael Phelps is a genetic freak, and he smokes too much pot. He eats way too much Subway. But for some reason, he's still able to go out and do it because he's a genetic freak. If you're not a genetic freak, you have to just stay focused for 12 weeks. That's all it is. 12 weeks. I get up today. Okay. I got to cut out that mocha chocolate latte, and I need to make sure I get to the gym. Shoot, i got too many meetings today, I can't get to the gym. All right, so if I just add 15 minutes more for four days a week, I'll get the same results as if I came seven days a week, so I just got to make sure I can get there four times. Does that make sense? Anybody think they can do that? Most of you can't because you can't stay focused. Focus on what is in front of you. This is my goal. I know this dessert here, but this is my goal. I know this drink is 250 calories. I really like that wine, but this is my goal. I know I need to go to the gym. They don't want me to go to lunch. I got to go to the gym. You just keep doing it over and over and over and over for 12 weeks, and there you are. That's all it is. It's pretty simple. 250 calories less eating, 250 calories more expenditure. There you are. The key is that sustained effort over time. Okay? So, I already gave you my disclaimer earlier. All right. So, there's my disclaimer spinning. Okay. So, you're going to ask questions afterwards. I'm going to let Jillian take over and talk a little bit about food specifically because we're running a little bit, not too bad late because I started late. But uh, um, I'll take all, we'll take all the questions at the end together. So, Rita Rock. I'm just going to say a little bit about myself and what I do. Uh, I used to be in issues. Recognizes and are 
every meal and that's just for whatever picture dietary needs is more active or less active. We also have a section on our menu that is called basic training and what that is is the low carb section. So we only have that in our dinner cooler because we recommend that as your last meal before bed. If you're trying to lose weight, it's you no know, starch and right before you go to bed and two vegetables with a lean protein. We also do have dinners that have less starch content than our lunches and our breakfasts. We recommend eating them earlier in the day and weighing off them if you're trying to lose weight. So we have a lot of different options like that. We also have soup salads. And all our food is made fresh from scratch with all natural ingredients. So you're not getting any processed food, high fructose, carbonated oil. It's already done the thinking for you, so it's, it's ready to go. You just throw it. All right, so in a nutshell, what's the purpose of this talk? Anybody know? How about removing excuses? There's no more excuses. Because this excuse is everybody's got them. Everybody likes to make themselves feel better by coming up with one of them. But this is what it's all about. It's about staying focused for a given amount of time. If you don't have time to prepare the food, Julian already did it for you. If you don't have time to get all the food that you need to get in throughout the day, Zeal already did it for you. If you don't have time to get your workouts in, uh, hire us and I'll hold you to it or I'll charge you for it. We'll see if they get you in there. Um, so we try to talk about today about exercise, how exercise relates to the diet, how everything basically is put together. It's just a series of systems, a series of applications to get where you want to be. But we're trying to, we're trying to help people by removing excuses. Carrie did a talk you know, a month ago, Women on Weight. Women don't like to do it, strength training out of, you know, lack of knowledge or whatever it is, but it's necessary. One of the things that we didn't talk about quite as much because it was covered in that talk and I didn't want to get into that is that if you don't strength train your diet without it, you think you can get away with it, your body strips off muscle. Your muscle does your metabolism. Without metabolism, your body decreases how many calories it needs and you can keep eating the same thing. Anybody, anybody here ever dieted, lost weight, started eating the same thing they ate before and gained it all back? That ever happened? You know why that happens? Well, one, because you weren't focused. But two, because you're not dealing with the same deck that, that you were dealing with before. It looks the same. Man, I was smaller. What the heck? Why did I gain all that weight back? Because when you ate before to maintain, just to maintain, you were eating for the person that you used to be. But you're not that person anymore. And if you didn't strength train, you're really not that person anymore. Because you don't have the same muscle you did before. Guess what, ladies? You can't lose as much weight as your husband sitting next to you because he has more testosterone, more muscle mass. All he has to do is not drink beer. <laughs> so if that happens, then you lose weight. But, I mean, that's, they're just built for it, right? So that's the unfortunate reality, you know. Um, you can lose weight pretty easily uh, regard, in, that, in that regard if you uh, have the right chemical makeup. So here's the thing. And this is, what, this is the last thing I'm going to cover because I'm tired of excuses. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this right here. Okay, this is my daughter's book. This is, this is Bernstein Bears, Junk Food. Now I'm going to read you a little excerpt out of this. Not actually read it, but I'm just going to go through it. Has. So the Bernstein Bears, they started, the little boy, little boy and girl start gaining some weight, and the mom says, okay, you're a little chubby, which wouldn't be politically correct now. I don't know if they'd even make this book now. But anyway... Um, so she takes all the sweets you call and all the cheesy poofs and soda and all the stuff, throws it in the freezer and not going to eat it. So, because they know that if they eat too much of that junk and not enough vegetables and fruits, they're not going to, they're going to get a little chubby because they're not doing enough exercise or watching too much TV. Dad's out there adjusting the antenna. And you know what this is? This is 1985. Here we are 20, 30 years later. And we still make the same stupid mistakes. Because we are really smart, but we are really stupid. Because we have all this information, all this stuff that I just told you, but the key is you got to stay focused. Because if you just do it and you do it sustained, you're going to get results. And that's the key. But when I say stay focused, most people think, okay, I'm going to Cancun and I want to lose weight for 12 weeks and then I'm going to go to Cancun and I'm going to go off my diet for a little bit and now I'll get back. Oh, man, I'm really busy. i get busy back at work. You don't have to stay really focused 
all you do is have to stay generally focused. But if you go way off in left field the way you were before, and you gain all that weight back and you end up starting over again, yes, that's stupid. Okay, but the whole thing is that this has to be a sustained thing for the rest of our lives. We have adjusted our um, activity level based on technology. We spend more time on Facebook than we do exercising a day. They say the average person spends five hours a week on Facebook. That's average. If you spent five hours a week moving on the treadmill, we wouldn't be talking right here because that's all it takes. It takes five hours of movement a week. But we don't move much anymore, and we don't like to stress ourselves because we're not used to it. Mom and Dad, Grandma and Grandpa, they had to work a lot harder than we did. Guess what they had to do? They had to walk to school. They had to pull plows. They had to work, do physical labor because they didn't have machines to do everything for them. Now we click, and we punch, and we, you know, make phone calls. That's the thing. Yeah. So, again, what, what, what this is about is, you know, if it, if it comes down to i got to go to Jillian's place and pick up the food for people, they have a massive refrigerator downstairs, I can keep it for a couple of days. But we'll do that for clients. We'll go and we'll do that stuff. If it, you know, comes down to, you know, all the simple nuts and bolts that we got to do some stuff for people, we're going to do that because we want to make sure they get results. But the key is, is that you got to just remove the excuses. If you don't live close to fit flavors, you know, if you have to resort to buying a stupid lean cuisine, it's better than going to McDonald's. I mean, it's ridiculous how much. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not telling you to go buy lean cuisine, but I'm telling you that if you're telling me you're going to go, I'm going to go to bread, kill them, I have lunch. Guess what? If you ate healthy, Mike and I had this conversation earlier, if you ate healthy at Bread Co., you've got problems. Your problem is, oh, I just had my little bowl of soup, which is 300 calories, and my little half sandwich, which is 300 calories, and I have my apple, which is 120 calories, and I have my coffee, and if you do the math, you just came up with like 900 calories. Now, that was good if you did half of that, but the problem was you ate it all at one time, and now you're supposed to eat again in three hours. So that's the key. Any questions about anything? We have covered a lot of stuff. I'm trying to make sure that you guys understand that everything kind of works together, but understand that glycogen is the key. And if you can bust your butt for a little while and not replenish that glycogen back to a full tank, if you can keep thinking about that tank, keeping that thing a little bit low, how do you know if it's a little bit low? Well, you'll know because you're, you'll feel a little weaker. Your legs are going to feel a little weaker. You're not going to feel quite on top of everything, but that's okay because once you get used to that, that's just kind of where you need to be. If you're trying to lose fat, if you're trying to optimally perform, you need to make sure you're back at that level. So, any questions? You guys have some questions. I covered a lot of stuff. So, any questions for Jillian? Okay, so she's got samples back there for you guys to try. I gave you the zeal to try. Um, it's a pretty good product. Like I said, I use it. I gave you a sheet. There's a sheet in front of you. Guess what that's about? Removing excuses. Because that thing tells you everything I told you in about a simple way we could possibly put it together. And put your little tips up on top, and all you got to do is check the box. But you'd be surprised how many clients forget to check that box every single day, and they don't even know where they're at. So... If you got any questions, on the bottom of that paper is my contact info. You can contact me anytime. And if you need to contact Jillian or you want to contact Jillian, I can put you in touch with her. She said she's got cards back there. You can grab those as well. I have cards in the back. Thanks for coming. We appreciate it. We will have another talk next month. Next month's topic is sports performance. So if you yourself or you have kids that uh, are into sports, that want to know a little bit more how they can optimally perform, the talk is geared toward that level. It's not geared toward the high performance, you know, collegiate athlete. It's geared more toward uh, getting kids ready to pre and prepared to compete. So uh, that's our talk next month. It'll be, uh, I think it's April, uh, I can't remember the date. I think it's April 18th, something like that. So uh, I've got you guys. As long as you feel like if you didn't fill out that sheet to tell me you were here, you need to because I need to make sure everybody, the people downstairs know I've got how many people i got. So uh, make sure you sign that, put your email on there, and I'll keep you in touch. Thanks a lot for coming.